develop a story arc like a writer. I develop a process on how I'm going to like funnel through the information. Um, and then I ultimately decide like, what do I think is going to grab people's most attention? And if I showed this to my friend and they read it, would they actually get what I'm talking about? I'm your host, Adam Met, and today we're talking to Christy Drudman, the founder and face of Brown Girl Green. After working with many climate organizations, including Students Against Fracking, Christy graduated from Berkeley's Society and the Environment program in 2017. Just after finishing school, Christy created Brown Girl Green, a media hub which centers identity and self-care in relation to the climate movement. Christy not only wanted to create a safe space for people like her, but also wanted to ensure people were hearing the stories of people of color facing climate challenges. We talk about curating climate science for an online audience, reclaiming power from corporations, and fighting eco-anxiety. A quick reminder that we're planting a tree for every person who subscribes to this podcast, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, here is Christy Drutman on Planet Reimagined. So, Christy, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Amazing, amazing. So I want to get right into it because we have so much to talk about today. You graduated from school in 2017, but since then you've interned or worked at such a wide range of places. And I'm excited to talk to you about all of these different things, but I want to start with a really important piece of the conversation. So. You run a media hub called Brown Girl Green. It's a podcast, social platform, YouTube channel articles, and a lot of other things. First and foremost, why is it important to have both race and gender as such a central part of this movement? And clearly it's incredibly important or you wouldn't have included both of them in the title of your media hub. Yeah, no, I love this question. I mean, I think as a woman of color in the environmental space, I I feel like talking about my own experiences of being a woman of color in this space was why I created Brown Girl Green was feeling this isolation that I didn't see other people who looked like me in this space, um, didn't feel like I had a lot of mentors or educators or networks um, to feel like I could really succeed or thrive in this field. Um, And that really frustrated me. That was at the root of why I created this platform is because I met other um, women of color um, and just black indigenous and people of color who felt similarly, felt like a lot of mainstream environmental platforms um, and narratives and spaces uh, were not diverse and did not look like the people who came from our communities, even though you know, I was learning during school about all of these um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color who live on the front lines of the climate crisis, who don't get the same kind of attention or space to share their stories or the same kind of, um, yeah, recognition that they deserve. So I saw like both of those parallels, like me feeling excluded and not included in this space, but also seeing like this broader, more systemic exclusion of those narratives and feeling like my experience was just a symptom of this bigger systematic issue uh, internally within the environmental sector. And so I feel like talking about race and gender is in a way a prognosis of this issue. And my approach of using my media hub um, and my voice as, as a form of medicine, I guess, to address that crisis that I feel is happening in in environmental storytelling. So I'm sure you've gotten questions similar to that a lot. And I just want to kind of flip it back on itself a second. Do you think that's a fair question for us to be asking in the middle of the climate movement right now? Or should we have all of these voices and it be such a a range of people, it's not even necessary to ask that question in the first place about why it's important, and they should just be engaged from from the beginning. You know, I mean, I think in general, like it'd be really nice to live in a world where patriarchy was not harming me, where racism wasn't harming me, where sexism wasn't harming me, like all of these things, like it would be so nice. 
if we lived in a world where it would be so common sense for people to not live with so much hatred, but that's not the real reality of the world we live in. So we do need to talk about it. Agreed. Agreed. So now you are representing a, a range of different communities and you have such a voice in this movement. What is that responsibility like to be representing yeah. this range of communities? Yeah, I mean, like I like people can probably find on my website, I call myself a Jew Pina. So I'm Jewish American, I'm Filipina American, I'm second generation, um, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander, like all of these things. I'm also, you know, an educator and a speaker. So I take all of those things to heart that these are all my identities um, that make up like my role in the movement. And I think the responsibility I feel in that is kind of, I don't want to say staying in my lane, but kind of realizing that in order for me to not feel burnt out from my activism, I felt like I needed to tap into like what my strengths were to really bring to this movement because I didn't feel like I could just be everything. I didn't feel like I could be someone maybe like fully mobilizing on the streets or I didn't feel like I was fully that person um, who was shifting money and finances or I wasn't that person who was like doing international policy even though you know down the line would love to do that too um I felt like I wanted to operate out of space of like what am I good at I just wanted to make sure that I was operating out of the space of like joy and out of like feeling like I was contributing my my best to the movement and for me that was through storytelling through interviewing through connecting with people um, and sharing that. So I never try to claim I'm something I'm not. And I feel like that's a part of my responsibility is being very transparent about what I do and don't know. Because I don't know everything. And I'm not going to say that I am the movement. I will never say that. But I would like to say that with having my platform grow as big as it has, and like the amount of amazing people I've been able to connect with and connect those people with other people um, out in the world, I do feel like I have a responsibility to hone in on my strengths of, of operating that platform to make sure that I'm, you know, citing my sources, to make sure that I'm always recognizing my own privilege in the space that I'm taking up to make sure that like I'm sharing that space with people who um, are more marginalized than I am. Um, so just trying to find that balance of both like honing in on like, these are my experiences of feeling oppressed and marginalized in this space, but also knowing that, um, there are people that have it so much worse than me and that I always have to like, make sure that I'm reshifting that, um, and being an ally myself too. I want to talk about one of those strengths that you're mentioning. So on this podcast, we've talked a lot about the transition out of the information age and into the age of curation, which is, I think, a really important distinction uh, for people to, to think about. I would call you, like myself, a curator of content in our fields in order to get people engaged. And I want to quote you for a second. You said, those of us using social media are trying to categorize everything to make it easier for people to get access. And I really like that. So I want to ask you, what are the benefits and drawbacks of giving people like you and me that power of curation? Yeah. Oh, I love that. I didn't even know I said that. That's awesome. <laughs> go, go Christy of the past. I don't remember even saying that. But um, I would just say that the pros of it is that you can cover a wide breadth of topics. Like I feel like people, it allows the space for more resources to be put out there that people otherwise probably wouldn't have access to or the news isn't covering. Um, as we see even from the, the Yale climate opinion maps of 2020, um, people are barely even talking about climate change or even know that it's connected to human made causes. Sure. Um, so definitely recommend people check out the Yale climate opinion maps. Um, and so it's like, well, who's filling that gap of media information? If the news isn't covering it, if our classrooms aren't covering it, then where are people getting their information? It's maybe these news articles that are amazing outlets, but you know, where are those outlets even getting circulation? How are they distributing their news outside of their target audience? And so I feel like for media curators um, like myself, we are tapping into like 
finding that information that we find interesting and being able to give it a new home to redistribute that information to people that otherwise probably wouldn't even know it exists. Um, but with that being said, like it's getting filtered through me, right? So right. similar to like CNN or Fox News, they all have their biases. They all have their filters on what they prioritize and what they talk about. And it's not necessarily as of like, oh, I look at something like a community that's suffering and I'm like, oh, well, I don't have the capacity to post about that today. So forget, it's not, it's not that easy. It's very complicated. It's very much like when you are a small independent media entity like me, and I don't have a sizable scalable team right now, there's, there's only so much you can do. And so with that being said, the scope is limited. And so I always try my best to redirect people to other organizations who are talking about these things. I always tell people to follow other places. So I think for the, the middle ground is how are you also creating new signals to both the algorithm and to your audience to redirect them to more resources, organizations, and communities that they wouldn't know about. So that way you're not putting it all on yourself and nor should you put it on yourself to give all that information. It's actually even more important to amplify that ecosystem of who else exists, who can also create those teachable moments and probably do it better than even I could for sure. I love that metaphor of an ecosystem because you see so many people jumping on the climate bandwagon in the last few years saying like, oh, climate is a space where I can invest a lot of money and make a tremendous amount of money or I can become an influencer in the climate space. But really recognizing that you're part of an ecosystem that started decades, if not, you know, many, many, many decades ago. So yeah. I love that you're, you're situating yourself within the larger conversation. And I want to dial into one specific thing that you mentioned. So I'm finishing up my PhD. You've been studying environmentalism for a long time, both in school and working with many different organizations. Where do you think academia fits into the environmental movement now? And what should it be doing differently? Yeah, I mean, I just view academia as a way to give people resources. I think, again, like, even in my experience as like a woman of color, like I think people do trust me more because they know I went to UC Berkeley. Like there's a weird, it's kind of weird though. You know, there's like a weird elitism to it where it's like, okay, like what if I went to a Cal State or like, what if I what, mm -hmm. got a certificate, but I still like developed an expertise in this. It's like interesting how that all works. But it's one of those things where academia is still like a very revered institution. And so it allows people to have that kind of mobility and access to get those resources. And I know for a fact, at least from my experience, like a lot of the things that I learned um, from my professors in undergrad are still things that like I use to like create content now. Like I take really dense academic journals that I still have access to. And I break that down into posts. Like people always tell me that like, they'll go back and they're like, whoa, you just broke down like a super complicated topic. Like I, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it took me like three, three to four weeks to do that. Like, and, and I think that's the important thing to talk about. Like with a lot of the rich information I think is out there, especially by climate scientists and people that study this on an academic level, like, how are you making your information accessible to people? You're probably not because you're focused on your dissertation. You're not making infographics. So it's like one of those things where like I've been contacted by some PhD students who asked me like, how are you able to break down these really complex topics? Like what has been the response? What does that look like? Um, and I'm also like, okay, that's great. You're interviewing me for your research to examine how I'm doing that. But I'm like, could you do that too? Like, that'd be really interesting to collaborate with people in academia who do have this expertise to help make my content better and make other people's content better. I loved that. That was great. I want to, I have a couple more questions in this area. Okay, I'm really ahead, interested in it. Um, is that... Is that right? Is that what should be happening? Should academia need a conduit to the general public that is people like you? Or should academia really be focusing just as much on communication as it does on research? Or should that not? 
how should this work in your opinion? That's a good point. I mean, I think it's a balance. Like I think like for such a long time, communications work in this space has been devalued. I can tell you that from like firsthand. I've been doing this for almost four years now, have explored climate communications for almost like five or six years now. And I can tell you that people valuing this kind of work has only been maybe in the past year or two. Definitely. And so it's like one of those things where I find it fascinating that all of a sudden it's emerged this way because there's still gatekeeping. There's gatekeeping around, well, are you allowed to talk about that? Because you don't have a PhD. People have told me that. They're like, you don't have a PhD. Why are you allowed to like talk about these issues? And I'm like, because I'm allowed to talk about these issues. Like, yep. so I find that interesting, the gatekeeping around it. I would like to figure out like how there can be more programs that are accessible to people. I mean, that's a whole other thing. Having access to higher education, period. It mm -hmm. presents so many barriers specifically to black, indigenous and people of color, period, yeah. outside of this space. So you're expecting with all these barriers for a young person of color to go into a field where they're not guaranteed to have a great return on their investment, no. especially if they want to go into communications and you want them to go into debt to get this quote unquote PhD or master's degree um, to become an expert and join the other experts who are failing to communicate these issues to the general public. Interesting. It's so anyways, I get a little heated about this. <laughs> I'm, just say I'm just saying like there needs to be more unity, right? There needs to be more of a like climate scientists I think are doing amazing work and have really, I mean, through programs like you know, Yale and, and other folks at George Mason, like they're really trying to like figure out how to get this stuff right and down to a science, which I think is awesome. But there's also the people factor, the emotions, the storytelling. And I don't know how much of that has been thought about or invested into um, beyond those two programs I just mentioned in other realms of academia, of people who are coming up with like climate tech solutions or carbon sequestration approaches, or, you know, talking about climate justice in theory, but not actually like talking to the people on the ground. Like I see so many of these gaps in relationship building um, that I just wish could be bridged more if people found more value in it. Definitely. And so how do you determine the stories that you're telling, the yeah. amount of information and the information that you choose to pull out of these yeah. extremely detailed pieces of yeah. research I mean, of course you can't communicate all of it. So what's your process like of saying, okay, I'm gonna communicate numbers one, two, and three, but I'm gonna leave out four, five, and six because we don't have the space. And people's attention span, honestly, can't really accommodate numbers four, five, and six at the moment. So how do you how do you make those choices? Yeah, I mean, I think the way that I go about it is I think about a story arc before I even go in. Um, to the data or the information I'm presented. Um, so for instance, I made a really complicated post about um, climate resilience, but from the grassroots. Mm. And when you read the post on my Instagram, it looks pretty simplified down. Like it, it's a pretty good breakdown in my opinion of a very complicated topic where this organization I was working with um, basically came up with a program to be able to teach farmers how to grow their own crops to be able to profit from it, but also in the process of that, um, teaching farmers how to also like be able to address um, natural disasters way before they hit um, and be able to like prepare the soil in a way so that way it doesn't erode. And it's like this whole complex thing they call like a golden nexus. Suffice to say, we don't need to go into all the details of that. But what I'm trying to say is, this organization gave me this really dense article that explained their process. Um, and I had to somehow figure out how to turn that into a 10 slide carousel. Yeah. Um, and I started off by realizing, okay, well, what's the thing that appeals to me the most just hearing about this without even reading this. And it was like, oh, this is a climate solution. Great. Okay. So I need to explain how it works, why it works, who says it works, and how can people get more involved, like as a as a thing later on? 
And from there, I was like, I don't know what's going to fit in all those buckets, but let me figure it out. And then I broke it down and then somehow magically through the work of me and my amazing team members, we were able to put together something really cool for that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I develop a story arc like a writer. I develop a process on how I'm going to like funnel through the information. Um, and then I ultimately decide like, what do I think is going to grab people's most attention? And if I showed this to my friend and they read it, would they actually get what I'm talking about? That's a great point. And using somebody like that almost as a focus group, I think is really helpful because like we were talking about before, especially in academia, you're surrounded by people who have the same types yeah. of backgrounds and the same types of, you know, viewpoints on things. So showing it to people who don't have expertise in these yeah. areas, I think is really important. Yeah. I want to jump into the resilience question because you brought it up. Um, <laughs> Resilience, and we don't we don't have to go into too much detail on the technical side of it, but resilience is, like you said, it's really complicated. And so much of resilience is focused on policy. And yeah. you focused more on the grassroots side of yeah. educating individuals about it. So I'm going to read you one more quote <laughs> by you. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> environmentalism is not just fighting the big mean corporate power of the fossil fuel industry it's also reclaiming our power to protect and restore our communities to be in better harmony with nature how do we make that happen how do we create that balance between you know naming and shaming but also making sure corporations are making changes with reclaiming the power of individuals like the example you were just talking about with farmers and resilience yeah, I mean, I love that question. I would say that like, what's really important is, um, like I said, you can't just keep things on social media. And I think everyone has a role to play. Like I said, I view my platform as like a starting point for people. But I always tell people that like, you know, these platforms and these things need to be used as tools to like, organize and connect with others who are actually challenging systems of power, yeah. um, if we're really going to see changes offline on the ground. Um, and so I think it's like that balance where I always try to like provide kind of a comfort space for people to like feel like they're not alone. But I also try to push people out of their comfort zone to recognize like you always need to like be pushing yourself to do more. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's a balance like we can't remain complacent and afraid but we also like need to do whatever we possibly can to so i think it's it's both of those things and i think that's part of the reclamation piece is like well don't just act like these corporations it's this inevitable thing mm -hmm. like if you think it's inevitable then it's going to be inevitable Sure. And I think that that is the lie that we are sold right now as a society. And I think if people really realize, like, we have big corporations literally paying millions of dollars into market research to get into, like, the brains of Gen Z to understand what do we care about. Um, they're doing research into unions to actually understand, are these unions a threat to their companies? Like, they are scared of the prospect of being called out and torn down. And so I hope people just recognize that like the reclamation of the power is pretty much at the core of calling these things out. I do want to ask one more thing before, before we wrap up. And it's kind of circling back to the beginning where we started. So you've built a platform for yourself and there are other communities out there that help to elevate black and indigenous and Asian and Latinx and other narratives and actions in the climate crisis. So we're starting to see more of these people have a voice, both yeah. online and in person. Yeah. However, we are only at the very beginning of seeing this in the corporate space and in the policy space. Mm -hmm. How can we take the successes that you and others have had in the digital space and move it over to make sure that corporations and policymakers are using this same approach. Yeah, I mean, I think a key part of it is definitely holding those companies accountable. Um, I think 
a big thing that's starting to emerge is, is the concept of advisory boards. Mm -hmm. So companies who are now trying to find, um, you know, diverse groups of people to come in and like advice, give advice on like, you know, their strategic plans um, and being able to figure out how to include them more. So I think more companies need to figure out how to like find the budgeting and be able to like actually like make that happen. Um, I think also in the policy space, I know that like um, there's now the interagency council like for environmental justice in the White House, which is awesome with folks that like I know, um, which is even cooler. Um, but we need more of that. We need more um, people who are like supporting bills and legislation that um, is going to be supported and advocated by that group. So I think people should definitely just like read up on um, what environmental justice policy or bills are actually being discussed right now in Congress and actually contact your representatives to um, really prioritize that. There needs to be more incubators mm -hmm. that provide opportunities for black indigenous and people of color to like be in politics, to get into these environmental companies and organizations, because as much as you can like bring them in, whether or not they're going to want to stay in the environment you create for them is a whole different story. And so my question always is, um, like, how can we continue to like demand that there is those gaps um, and to like make sure that that's known by as many people as possible? Um, and then, you know, ideally be able to like have that shift where those resources could be redistributed. That's incredible. I couldn't agree more. I want to hear very last thing, where can people hear more of what you're working on, more of what you're doing? Yeah. So yeah, thank you everyone for listening today. Um, I'm Christy Drutman again. Uh, you can find me on the Brown Girl Green podcast. I'm also Brown Girl Green on social media and my website is browngirlgreen.org. This has been so inspiring and so interesting and creative and i really love everything you're doing that we talked about today and many of the things that we didn't even get to talk about today that you're doing on and offline so thank you for for all of your work in the climate space and beyond and particularly around contextualizing it in the, in the larger scope of people's lives i think that's so incredibly important it was lovely to meet you thank you so much thank you everyone <laughs>